So what's wrong with storage today? As the adage goes, we just want storage that's fast, cheap, and good, but we can only choose two of these. And there's a lot of requirements implied by being good. Even under ideal conditions, it's difficult to get predictable performance from your storage. For example, the on-disk layout of files is really opaque to applications, but that layout on disk can drastically impact performance. Sequential access is more than 100 times as fast as random access. And nowadays, like everything else, we want our storage to be green and save energy. So what's so hard about that? Can't we just have everything? Well, there's a lot, actually a lot of disciplines involved in storage, starting with the actual hardware and the folded sheet metal. Um, back in 2006, Sun released one of the densest storage arrays at the time uh, with 48 top-loading hard drives and a two-socket AMD Opteron uh, computer inside. When we were testing uh, ZFS on early versions of this hardware, we found that there was always one or two slow drives. These ones, right in the front of the disk array. Any idea why that one was the one that was slow? I'll give you a hint. It's the same reason that this drive that this guy is about to yell at is going to get very slow. That's because vibration has a big impact on drive performance. In the early days, uh, these chassis weren't quite rigid enough, and so the drives in the front left would be slower than the other ones. In this example, the chassis is just fine, but the external vibrations induced by this guy shouting at it causes the drive's read-write heads to take a lot longer to seek to the correct track. But really, all these hardware problems are nothing compared to the horrors of firmware. There is a particular drive firmware where the computer could ask it to perform a particular pattern of writes to specific offsets. Some of the writes wouldn't actually be transferred to the platter. So this is a type of silent data corruption. Unless we proactively address this, when the application reads, bla reads back block C here that was dropped, it's going to get the wrong data. So software's job is pretty easy. We just have to fix all these problems without introducing any new ones. Fundamentally, OpenZFS brings enterprise reliability to everyone. Uh, I started working on ZFS back at Sun Microsystems in 2001, um, and we released the source code in 2005 as part of the OpenSolaris project. When Oracle took over and canceled OpenSolaris, the community stepped up and created Lumos, which is a continuation of the OpenSolaris project. Today, uh, OpenZFS is available for all your favorite operating systems, um, including as a Linux kernel module. Um, so ZFS uh, addresses all those hardware issues that we mentioned uh, that we saw previously. So uh, back in 2001, uh, when we started the project, checksums were considered way too computationally expens expensive to perform on the main CPU. But we think that um, it's worth it to know that when you read data off the disk, it's actually the data that the application wrote. So ZFS checksums both all of your metadata and all your data. And you know, nowadays, CPUs have gotten so much faster that the checksum time is almost imperceivable. We also always store two copies of all of, all of the metadata in the file system. So if uh, even despite additional redundancy of mirroring or RAID-Z, uh, if, if some data is lost, then the worst case is that only the amount of data that was destroyed by your disks is actually gone. You can still access everything that's still there because of the redundant metadata. And um, also, ZFS is a copy and write file system. That means that whenever we write something to disk, we're not overwriting existing data. This makes it very easy to guarantee that our on-disk format is always consistent. So if there's a power outage, uh, you never need to run a utility like FSCK to restore consistency to your file system. ZFS has a lot of modern features. Um, so for example, uh, RAID-Z is like RAID-5 but uh, you can have one, two, or three parity devices. So you could lose up to three devices without uh, losing any data. And like the rest of ZFS, it's always consistent on disk. It isn't subject to the RAID 5 write hole, where uh, a RAID stripe can become inconsistent if there's a power failure. Built-in features like ZFS send and receive enable efficient remote replication and backups. So lastly, we really wanted to make ZFS easy to use. We saw how hard it was for system administrators to, to administer separate file systems, volume managers, and storage arrays, um, and we really wanted to end their suffering. In addition to uh, at things that are obviously easy administrative features like hierarchical properties, we see a lot of these other features like uh, snapshots and clones as really usability features uh, because they reduce the load on system administrators. They don't have to go back to tape anymore to restore backup if somebody accidentally deleted, deleted a file. Instead, you can just go get it from a snapshot. A lot of these scale, we also implemented a lot of scalable algorithms. Again, we see that not so much as, uh, I mean, it's essential to performance, but it also makes it easier 
to configure and use because you don't have to worry so much about how many files do I have in a directory? How many, uh, how many terabytes of storage do I have in one file system? Uh, because ZFS scales very well. So when we designed ZFS, uh, we wanted to take a step back at how and look at uh, how existing storage software worked and see uh, if we could redefine the boundaries between it. So we actually uh, incorporate both the functionality of file systems and volume managers, meaning that we take responsibility for uh, storing the data correctly using uh, checksums and mirroring so we have redundancy, as well as uh, doing file system operations like uh, handling uh, file owners, groups, uh, and permissions. We divided up the software stack into um, several components that are really different than what we saw before. So in the old way of doing things, a lot of information could get lost across this boundary between file systems and volume managers because they're just talking about reading and writing blocks on disk. With ZFS, uh, we've repartitioned this work. Um, so the lowest level now is roughly analogous to a volume manager in that it's responsible for on-disk integrity, but there's a much richer interface between it and the higher levels. So when the upper level, called the DMU, needs to write something to disk, it doesn't tell the, the storage pool where it needs to be written. It actually lets the storage pool manage the allocation. So it just says, I have this bunch of data. Please, please store it reliably for me. And then at the storage pool level, it says, great, let me take that data. I'm going to compress it. I'm going to allocate space for that compressed size. Maybe I need to allocate a little bit of additional space to store the parity information. Um, and then it writes it to disk and tells the upper layers, great, here's the token that you can use to get that back when you need to read it. So ZFS works great as a lower cost, more featureful, easy to use replacement for legacy enterprise storage. But how does that fit into cloud scale infrastructure? I mean, EBS always has consistent performance. It's always performs great, and it never mysteriously disappears for a little while. So why do we even need any of this? OK, so that's not actually true. But even if you're stuck with your cloud provider's crappy storage, ZFS can still help. For example, you can, store mirrored, you can use ZFS to store mirrored copies of your data. If one EBS volume disappears, then ZFS seamlessly uses only, only the good volume. And when the bad volume comes back, ZFS automatically resilvers only the data that was written while it was offline. So the recovery is very quick. And if the performance of uh, EBS volume becomes unacceptable, you can find another one that's faster and use ZFS attach and detach to move your storage to that faster volume. Again, this is an online operation. It takes place while your application is running. You can also use ZFS's built-in support for dedicated cache and log devices to, to take advantage of a small amount of flash-based storage to accelerate your application's reads and writes without needing all flash volumes. And we can even replicate data in one VM in one cloud to a different cloud provider using ZFS send and receive. And this is the approach taken by uh, a company that uses OpenZFS called Hybrid Cluster. So they, they use ZFS to provide more reliable, more featureful storage on top of third-party cloud infrastructure providers. But so we saw a great practical solution for existing uh, public clouds. But given the choice, how would we architect a modern data center for scale? So we could start by combining the compute nodes and the storage nodes into one computer. Then for reliability, we can spread out uh, each VM's data across a bunch of different nodes, maybe using erasure coding so that we can reconstruct it if one computer dies. So when accessing a given VM's storage, uh, we just need to talk to all the different nodes that have all the different pieces of data. This gets really complicated really quick. And so to do that, we just need to put a really big switch in there, uh, a really big networking switch, plus plenty of CPU and proper tuning of TCP offload to drive the millions of packets per second that we're going to need. Uh, so the key to that architecture is having really fast network ports and really big switches. And over the past 30 years, network speeds have gotten about 10,000 times faster, which is really impressive. But even more impressive than that is, that is how much faster storage has gotten big. So storage sizes have increased even more quickly than that. Storage is now over a million times cheaper than it was 30 years ago. Because data set sizes are increasing so much faster than network speeds, it's becoming less and less practical to access bulk data over the network. We need to really rethink our data center architecture. So the answer to this is to move the compute to the data, rather than shipping the data across the network to the compute. So here, we have a hypervisor running several different VMs. 
all the, all the data associated with those VMs is stored locally. We, use, we can use OpenZFS to store that data locally reliably. But we still need to worry about things like load balancing. So when we need to migrate a VM to a different server, we can use ZFS send and receive to incrementally send the changes to the volume, to its volume, to the new server. Send and receive uses internal ZFS data structures to quickly determine which files and which blocks of those files were modified between two given snapshots. We know when, when every block was written, so we can easily traverse directly to the data that, that was changed, so it only takes time proportional to the actual amount of data changed. Unlike solutions like rsync, which need to examine every file and every block of modified files to determine what needs to be sent. This architecture also makes it really straightforward to use lightweight containers to be able to spin up compute jobs close to the data. So this is using technologies like Solaris Zones, FreeBSD Jails, or Linux LXC. It's, the end result is that this is like having your EBS and your S3 storage always on local storage. And this is a solution that's been implemented by Joint with their Smart Data Center and Manta products, which are based on OpenZFS. And I was talking to their CTO, Brian Cantrell, the other day, and he said that they couldn't build Manta without OpenZFS. So what is OpenZFS? In addition to the great software that we just talked about, ZFS is a community of developers. OpenZFS is available on lots of different platforms, and there's lots of different people working on it on all these different platforms. We wanted to make sure that uh, people were aware of how to use ZFS and where that it actually works on all these different platforms and make sure that people working on it are aware of what people on other platforms are doing. So we created this OpenZFS project, uh, OpenZFS community, just about one year ago. And of course, as a good, any good open source project, the very first thing that we did was create a website and a mailing list. Uh, but we're also holding uh, office hours where anyone can call in. Um, we do them online. Uh, basically, it's a way to talk to an expert in ZFS, somebody who's developing that source code, and, uh, and talk to them over video chat and uh, IRC to ask questions and, and find out what's, what's new, what they're working on, and, what's, and how to best use ZFS in their situations. When we uh, started the, the ZFS project back at Sun Microsystems, there was just one company creating all the source changes for ZFS at Sun. When uh, it was open sourced and uh, used by lots of different companies um, and, and lots of different platforms, it was ported to platforms like Linux and FreeBSD. But there's a problem with this development model, which is that all the source changes just moved in one direction. So uh, we essentially accidentally forked the source code uh, from when we ported that software from Illumos to Linux and FreeBSD and macOS. Um, this requires continual work to make sure that we stay in sync so that all the great features that are being developed for, for ZFS on Linux, for example, make it into these other platforms. But it's very difficult to do that with the current development model. This is something that's really unique to a kernel component that needs to be uh, actively ported to different platforms rather than being able to just recompile the code in user land like you can with lots of, uh, with lots of software packages. The solution to this is actually uh, to, so to create a platform independent open source code repository that we're calling the open source, the open ZFS repo. The idea is that the end result will be that um, all of these different platforms will be able to pull and push code from the open ZFS repo. Um, so if I make a change on FreeBSD to make ZFS a little bit faster, then I can uh, push those changes to OpenZFS, and then that change can be pulled down into a, another platform like Linux. The way that this is uh, much easier is that we're, we're making it so that you can actually compile ZFS into user land to test it, so you can test ZFS on any platform and be confident that, that, that your code changes will work well on every platform. So this has enabled a lot of different companies to create products based on OpenZFS. So I mentioned a few of them earlier. Um, I'd also like to point out uh, Cloudia Systems. So they've actually created a new operating system from scratch designed specifically for use in the cloud. Um, it only runs on hypervisors, um, and it takes advantage of the fact that in modern data center architecture, you're pretty much just running one application on each computer. So they've cut through a lot of different layers of complexity. Um, and uh, one of the few components that they chose to, to not design from scratch was ZFS. So how can you get involved with OpenZFS? Um, if you're making a product based on ZFS, let us know. We we'd, we'd love to talk to you about how, how to best integrate with ZFS and uh, help you get the word out on, um, to, to other people who are using ZFS and get the right expertise that you need. If you're using ZFS, 
then let people know that ZFS is available on whatever platform you're using and uh, tell them how you're using ZFS and how it works for you and tell us how it doesn't work for you so that we can improve it. If you're working with the source code, then join our mailing list. You can get help and feedback on code changes. So to sum up, ZFS provides reliable local storage, enabling the next generation of data center scale out and opens if and OpenZFS ensures that continued innovation in open source ZFS is available on all your favorite operating systems. Thank you. <laughs>